Kinesis 415. This is a um, developmental video uh, to help us um, develop and master the concepts from the last video. Don't worry about this or worry about that. Um, so uh, as long as you hear me, that's that's the most important thing. So what uh, what I'm going to try to do is tie everything together from our first two lectures in terms of movement strategies, why we develop certain movement strategies, and then review uh, agonistic muscle groups and contraction type, the stuff that I'm going to have you guys uh, do on your first test, right? Um, Preseason review before we And then there's real small uh, gymnasts, right? And they all have unique body types. And a lot of times those body types help in their sport activity. The point is everyone that's born ha is on this continuum. Movement is no different. You have these two extreme ends, just like you have with height, where you have um, simultaneous motion, multiple joints moving at the same time to accomplish something, to do something. And then you have sequenced motion, uh, multiple joint motions, uh, well, sometimes it's multiple. It could just be one. A, a one is a sequence. In other words, if a joint motion is done without any other... to the ground, and thus the ground, because of Newton's third law, yay, Newton, gives back the exact same amount of force you gave it, just in the opposite direction. And what ends up making you and all of that weight go up? The ground, responding to what you're trying to do. Think about it like this. You're trying to push the floor into the center of the earth. The floor isn't going anywhere. So you get all that back to be able to move what is more likely to, <laughs> to move, and that's this. This weighs less than the Earth, right? So let's take a look at it and talk about the simultaneous motion, okay? Right away, you see knees moving with hips. Not so much here yet because we don't need to yet, but think about it. If all he did was flex his hips, the mass would fall forward over his base of support, right? He'd lose his balance. And if all he did was flex his knees, he would go back. So his hips want him to go forward at the same time as his knees want him to go back. And guess what? When they work together, I don't know why I have spirit hands, but when they work together, they cancel each other out and he gets to go straight down. Kind of felt like Austin Powers right there, okay? So let's observe this simultaneous motion of knees and hips being forceful and being accurate. Knees and hips, knees and hips, knees and hips. And of course, ankles move when they need to. Come on, buddy, you can do it. All right, spoiler alert, he gets it. So simultaneous motion, very advantageous when you need to produce maximum force on something. And with maximum force on something comes maximal 
accuracy. Because again, think about it, that weight is very directional. It's straight down, right, as we perceive down. So his force on that weight needs to be very directional as well. It needs to be straight up. Any force in the across is wasted energy, is wasted force. Okay? Now, agonist. Let's review agonist. Muscles at the knees, external forces, ground and gravity is trying to flex his knees. He doesn't need his knee flexors, he needs his knee extensors. Hips, ground and gravity is trying to flex his hips. Like an accordion, he doesn't need his hip flexors, he needs his hip extensors. So we identified the agonist at the hips and the knees, knee extensors, hip extensors. Well, on the way down, what motion did you observe? Well, you observed hip flexion. The only way the extensors can be responsible for flexion is through eccentric work. On the way down, you observe knee flexion. The only way the knee extensors can be responsible for knee flexion is through eccentric work. So going down was the eccentrics. The muscle is being lengthened while it is still trying to shorten above resting tone. Okay? Coming back up. Same agonistic group, same muscles are doing a job, right? In other words, if those muscles turned off at any time, he'd collapse to the ground. So you have the same muscles. Why do the same muscles need to be working? Because the same external forces is trying to collapse him. Ground and gravity didn't change, so the muscles that you call to do the job don't change. Okay? On the way up, you're going to still have your hip extensors and your knee extensors, but the motion you observe is going to be different. You're going to observe hip extension. So the only way the hip extensor is responsible for hip extension through concentric work, the muscle shortening while trying to shorten, doing what it's trying to do, making you move in the direction of their pull. Knees, knee extension, knee extensors, the muscles that pull in the direction of knee extension, knee extension, concentric work. Remember, why do we not give muscle function based on motion? Because of eccentrics and isometrics, right? In other words, if you looked in the book and you said uh, the quad, semimembranosus, uh, semimembranosus, hamstrings, vastus lateralis, medialis, intermedius, and rectus femoris, right? Mm, we're going to go over those in a little bit, in a couple weeks. But the point is, is that if you say, well, the rectus femoris would be working here during this exercise, yay, you're correct. But if you go in a book, is doing a job. He's preventing you from falling on your butt. There's no motion there, but it's still pulling in the direction of knee extension. It's still doing a job by pulling in the direction of motion. Think of it like this. What's the purpose of a batter in baseball? And some people may say, I know this is semantics, but it's important. Some people may say to get a hit. So if they don't get a hit, they didn't have a purpose. We know in Hall of Famers only get a hit three out of ten times. Every batter that has ever tried or went to bat is trying to get a hit. And sometimes you get a hit while trying to get a hit. Sometimes you get an out while trying to get a hit. And sometimes you walk while trying to get a hit. Trying is the important thing because it saves you from all possible outcomes. If you only say the purpose is to get a hit and you don't, that is not an outcome of the purpose. Trying to encapsulates every possible outcome. So these muscles are trying to cause motion. They are trying to shorten, but the outcome isn't always the motion that they're pulling in. That's important to understand about how muscles work. Okay. All right. Let's go on to another example. Let's go on to a power activity. Check this out. So remember with power, you have a little bit of both. You Continuum, right? You don't have just tall people and small people. You have some people that live in the middle. And the advantage of being in the middle is you get to take a little bit of both. You're taller than small and you're smaller than big. And there are some things you can do in the middle that those two extremes 
aren't advantageous for. Power means you got to use strength and accuracy, but there's an element of speed, so you're going to live somewhere in the middle. It's how our bodies use multiple joint motions in sequence. To make something relatively heavy could be you move significantly fast. The next video we're going to look at is javelin. Think about it. These two activities, shot put and javelin, have the same goal. Make the object that you're moving go as fast as possible. Because the faster I make it go, the further it's going to go. Right? Yeah, there's angles, but let's assume everyone released it at the same angle. We're going to control for angle. The one who moves that shot put the fastest is going to go the furthest. So how do you make something heavy go fast? You use a powerful movement strategy, one that incorporates simultaneous motions done in sequence. So let's see how this shot putter speeds up this put. Okay. All right. Here we go. First thing he's going to do is do a sequence of spinny things. Spinny things. Very scientific. And that's going to be joint motions. Some at the same time. Some in sequence. Left leg. Then right leg. Then left. Now look. That whole time, notice, he didn't move his upper extremity at all. All he did was lower extremity stuff. And then when he got to the edge to release the shot put as fast as he can, he's going to have lower extremity simultaneous motion and then upper extremity simultaneous motion. So he had multiple simultaneous motions done in sequence. Okay. I have another picture that we're going to look at later where you have like a, um, like a wall, a ball squat, like in CrossFit, you do the ball squats. Think about it. You do the lower extremity first and then you transfer into the upper extremity because that's a powerful motion. You, you wouldn't need to do that with a uh, pool ball, like an inflatable pool ball, right? Very light. I could do that with just my hands, but something heavy, you got to kind of get that momentum going using lower and upper. So uh, then he uses his upper. Let's see that part one more time. Okay. And look at that. That's, uh, that's when you know you got a good throw. You get that. Yeah, Adrian. I think my major professor taught me that the research shows that when you, when you uh, inflect a voice energy, uh, like in uh, my major professor was a, a black belt in Taekwondo and and she said something like 20 to 30 percent more uh, uh, energy that you can give when you hear Adrian, yo, right? When you yeah, kind of cool, right? Probably has to do with um, core and creating a rigid link. I'll put it to you simply: it's a lot easier to lift someone up when they're rigid versus when they're a loose sack of potatoes, right? So when you go. Yeah, it helps to create a more rigid core, so therefore you can transfer energy from lower to upper extremity. Layman's terms. All right, let's check out the javelin. So, same concept. You're trying to make something in your hand go as fast as possible, but the javelin doesn't weigh near the shot put. Shot put heavy, javelin light. So therefore, I don't need to use simultaneous motion. I could use a more sequenced motion joint motions done in sequence. Now think about it. Something heavy, I can't throw that shot put like I would throw a baseball. That heavy shot put would probably hurt my arm, right? In other words, the muscles at each individual joint couldn't handle the load of that put. But a javelin super light, I can handle that load. Each individual joint done in sequence. Baseballs are relatively light. They're not very heavy. So I can do all the different motions in a sequence, like a whipping action, because of super light. It's not heavy. Let's check out the sequence. Mm. 
multiple joint motions done one after the other. That's really cool. So that is the secret to how people can throw very far. Some genetic lottery tickets are very easy to see. Shaquille O'Neal, seven foot one. That's a genetic lottery ticket. Throwers, their genetic lottery ticket aren't as obvious. Some throwers are tall, some are short, it doesn't matter. What matters is, did you hit the lottery in terms of bringing your catapult back, your external rotation window? For throwers, they can Think about taking a spoon and slinging a pea across at your brother, sister, cousin. You want that spoon to cock back as far as you can to get maximum velocity of that pea. Now, I'm old and I'm retired, but my catapult doesn't go back very far. Oh, ow, owie. Look how far back that catapult's going and its trunk is leaning forward. So imagine if I leaned my trunk forward, I couldn't even get my catapult parallel with gravity, right? He's all the way back here. So that's the magic. Now, why don't we see these genetic lotto tickets? Because these motions happen so fast, our eyes can't process those frames per second. It's why you see blurs when things move super fast. So we have to slow it down. We have to use slow motion to really see oh, what's going on. So this would be a very sequenced motion. I mean, how did he move to speed the javelin up? Well, he ran up, he, he approached, that sped the javelin up. Then he had hip motion, which made his pelvis spin, which sped the javelin up. Then he had trunk motion, which sped the javelin up. Then he had scapula motion. Then he had shoulder motion. Then he had wrist motion, right? It's like a towel, popping someone with a towel. If you're trying to pop someone with a towel, your intent is to make the distal tip of that towel go faster than sound. You don't do that by crunching up the towel and throwing it all at once. You have to do it in sequence where every bit of the towel gets faster and faster and faster until you get to the tip. Okay, layman's terms. Let's see what else we got. Ah, throwing a dart. So this is one in your book. Throwing a dart doesn't require brute strength because the dartboard isn't very far. It requires accuracy. So where on the continuum is accuracy? Over here. So you can be accurate and you don't have to use a lot of force. And this is a good example. What I want you to notice is watch his elbow motion and his shoulder motion. If all he did was move his elbow, if all he did, if he kept his shoulder from moving and he moved his elbow, eventually the dart would start to go down. In other words, when it's just angulation, that dart won't follow a linear trajectory to be accurate. So what he has to do is elbow plus shoulder. Elbow wants to bring the dart down. Shoulder wants to bring the arm up. So when they work at the same time, they cancel out each other's angulation and they summate each other's translation. And that's super duper cool. Let's check it out. Watch elbow and shoulder. Elbow extension. Shoulder abduction. And when I say abduction, he's kind of in, in a combo, right? He's off to the side. So his shoulder motion would be more in that frontal plane. Elbow and shoulder. Oh, I got to bring this one up. Okay, so an exercise like this, sorry for the blur, would be simultaneous motion. Why? Because the machine is designed a certain way. There's the, the person who designed this machine wanted the handles to mostly go up and down. And if I only moved one joint, it's not going to go up and down. There's going to be spin. It's going to be pure rotation, more rotation. So the point is, is to make the hands go mostly up and down, I have no choice but to move elbow and shoulder, right? Push it down, let it come up, push it down, let it go up. 
So at the elbow, we're going to be working the extensors. At the shoulder, uh, in the sagittal plane, we're going to be working our shoulder flexors. But this is an example of simultaneous motion of an, of an exercise. Okay? This is what I was talking about, the ball squat, right? Where this would be more of a powerful movement, where the upper extremity won't start moving until we're finished speeding it up with the lower extremity. It's going to transfer that momentum into making the ball uh, move with significant speed, depending on how far you need to throw it, right? So notice, cocked, cocked. We call that prep phases in, in biomechanics, but you're prepped. It's like, metaphorically speaking, but like the, 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 the arrow is drawn back. It's ready to be released to move. Cocked, cocked. But this won't move until after this is done moving. That's my point. The lower extremity is going to, move first, and then you're going to transfer that momentum with the upper extremity. Powerful motion. Multiple, well, basically the easiest way to look at it is you have lower extremity simultaneous and upper extremity simultaneous, but they're done in sequence. Simultaneous motions, separate simultaneous motions done in sequence. Okay. Now let's take a look at something like a dumbbell curl. Now, ideally, you would like to just have a sequence of one, right? You're trying to isolate elbow motion, flexion extension. But because you're not closing other roads, you could potentially cheat with something like this. What I mean by that is you're flexing and extending, and let's say it gets real heavy. Well, you can lean back. That can help get some extra force. You can use your shoulder to help it get. Basically, it's easy to cheat with simultaneous motion if you need some extra juice, if you need some extra force. Okay, so this is intended to be a sequenced motion, a sequence of one, but it's easy to cheat. Okay, so what you can do is, okay, you could not do that. You can do something like this. If someone's having a tough time not cheating, right, you can close those roads. So that way they have no choice but to just do the sequence of one. Right? So in other words, in this machine, ah, can't use your shoulders. Ah, padding, can't use your back. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna close those roads so that you only use the muscles that we want you to use. What are those muscles? Elbow flexors. What are elbow flexors? One or more muscles, more than one, but multiple muscles that pull in the direction of flexion. They're gonna cause flexion only through concentric work. They're going to be responsible for extension through eccentrics, and they're going to prevent extension through isometrics. So if he's just holding this position, his elbow flexors, well, Dr. Campbell, why don't you just say bicep? And I'm like, well, that exercise isn't just working the bicep. And remembering Coco, if you forget about something, it, it dies a second death out of, out of sight, out of mind. So if we, all we ever did was say bicep, 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 then we forget that there's a brachialis, there's a brachioradialis, some, some, even some secondary tertiary muscles, uh, protator teres in there. So by saying the elbow flexors, you're never wrong. It's all of the muscles. It could be two, five, ten. When I say the Chicago Bulls, it's everybody on the roster. If I say the uh, New Orleans Pelicans, it's the whole roster. But if all I ever say is last night, uh, the, the New Orleans Zion Williamson defeated the it's not very fair to the other players that are contributing to that job. The team, right? This is team. So think of muscle groups as a team. Elbow flexors. If I observe elbow flexion, concentric work. If I observe elbow extension, eccentric work. If I don't observe any motion, isometric work. So again, we can't say that the action of the flexors is flexion because Two out of three times, I won't observe flexion while those muscles are working above resting tone. I'm going to observe extension through eccentrics, and I may observe isometrics. Okay. Sequenced exercise. Okay. Simultaneous, right? Hips, knees, powerful muscles. I need force and accuracy. Okay, force and accuracy, going down and coming up. Here's another way to look at, at, at force and accuracy. You wouldn't do it with this because it, it would be very unsafe. But imagine doing a squat with just the bar where, you know, it's not totally unsafe. I mean, it's always technically a, a, a risk. 
But imagine doing a squat, and to demonstrate how important accuracy is with a squat, I magically, for those of you that uh, watched uh, WandaVision, let me know. It was pretty cool. But if I snap my fingers, and before an unloaded squat with a bar, this guy had roller skates on his feet. You better be accurate with your four. I wasted some energy because <laughs> I wasn't accurate. I mean, I was mostly accurate, right? A 95 on a test is still pretty good. But in terms of trying to get up as high as I can, if I drift forward or if I drift back, I wasted energy. I wasted force. Okay. This is another example of a sequenced exercise that can be easily done simultaneously. So the intent, right, tricep extensions, uh, elbow extensions, a, a muscle contracts, joints move. So what muscles am I working here at the elbow? My extensors, who are those muscles? I'm going to teach you what those muscles are, the triceps, uh, a break eye, and the anconius muscle. But the point is, is that because the shoulders are not closed, those roads aren't closed, you could imagine using the shoulders along with the elbows, right, to get some extra force. You could see how easy it would be to use simultaneous motion here, okay? Now, you may want that. I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying as a fitness professional, and if all you wanted was to isolate this, then you need to control for that, whether that's with a spot, whether that's up against the wall, where the wall is serving as a means to prevent simultaneous motion, okay? Let's see, hey, we did this, we did that. So look, here's a good example of preventing cheating. This is just gonna be a sequence of one, right? I'm preventing shoulder, I'm preventing back. All he's gonna do is have a sequence of one, okay? Remember, sequence motion, my joints and the muscles that influence those joints have to be able to handle the weight. So when those muscles at that joint have to work by themselves, you can't do as much weight as when they have help. That makes sense, right? If all I'm doing is moving my elbows, I can't do as much weight as when I'm getting help from my shoulders. Common sense. Boy, this guy looks very excited. All right. Well, what about powerlifting? Powerlifting, well... Power, some of both, simultaneous and sequence. There's a speed component here, guys. You have to get that weight moving fast enough so that you have time to get up underneath it. That's the magic of the power. You got to move something heavy relatively fast so that you have time to get up underneath that. Okay, so there's going to be a sequence of simultaneous motions. Same thing with here, same thing with there. You have to get it moving fast enough so that you have time. And obviously, if <clears throat> this is pretty common sense, but if I have a ball, the faster I throw it up in the air, the more time it's in the air. And the more time I have, the easier it's going to be to get up underneath what I need to get up underneath. So in other words, if you're moving it super slow, it's not moving fast enough and you won't have time to get up underneath it. So the faster you can make that heavy thing move, the more time you have to get up underneath it. Again, layman's terms, okay? We're trying to keep it simple. All right. So that is your review. I say review. It's more of a, of a lecture to develop the concepts. I wanted to give you examples. I, you have examples in the book. But I wanted to specifically go over those examples, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, Hey, so if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, watch it as many times as you need. 
and of course virtual office hours if you uh, if you need to go over anything one-on-one uh, -on -one, just text me make sure you give me your name and what class you're in and uh, we'll come up with a time to zoom or to facetime and i can clarify anything okay all right guys be well